Good to see you. Good to see you, Anthony. It's been a long time, huh? Yeah, it's been a few years. I think. Um, yes, yes. Time flies three by. Three years. Yeah. Three, yeah. Three years. Four years. Even I don't know. A whole new it book seems... since last time. Oh, uh, four new books. Four new last... books. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, we're on to num number five in the series. Wow, we're looking so much forward. Well, I'll just turn the camera on to uh, Lucas, so you can see okay. him again, and we can begin. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching. You can support our work on our website, ageoftruth.tv. And please like our videos, subscribe to our channels on YouTube, BitChute and Brightian. And remember to hit the bell for notifications. And follow us on Instagram and Facebook. To be sure not to miss any of our shows, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, ageoftruth.tv. Hello and welcome to this edition of Age of Truth TV. I'm Lucas Alexander in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's the 23rd of January 2024 and our special guest has been with us before. He's joining us from Australia and he has just published a new fascinating eye-opening book, The Eden Conspiracy, and he's here to talk about the content of the book. The secret hidden symbolism and meaning behind the Holy Scriptures and the Bible and the ET connection to planet Earth during ancient civilizations and today. He is an author, researcher, investigative reporter and a former church minister. Paul Anthony Wallace. Good morning from Copenhagen, Denmark, and welcome to Age of Truth TV. Please like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. We are so excited to have our guest on today from Queensland, Australia. He's been with us before. He's a fascinating author, a very knowledgeable gentleman who's written a new book called, called The Eden Conspiracy. Good evening to our guest who is in this beautiful land down under in Australia with, well, they have beautiful nature, kangaroos, koala bears, emus, and Paul Anthony Wallace. G'day, Lucas. It's great to be with you once again. We were together here on the channel several years ago, and a lot has happened in the world. And you've written a series of books now, and you have a fascinating, explosive new piece of work called uh, The Eden Conspiracy that was just published here in 2024. We are in in the in the January 23rd, and uh, there's so much to cover here. And I would just like to... Uh, first of all, ask you about religion because you are focusing a lot on religion, obviously, because you you were you are a former church minister in England, and then you moved to Australia, got married there, and been living there for a long time. But you travel around the world um, due to your fifth kind television show and and other shows. And uh, there's so much knowledge in your book. You're decoding the meaning, the symbolism of these religious uh, ancient scriptures and the Bible and how that is connected to the ET alien connection on planet Earth during the ancient times, ancient civilizations, and also now today. And um, and there, there are so many, uh, well, connections and um, 
things to get into. And you were helping me a little bit also uh, here because uh, this is heavy stuff, actually. But first of all, I just want to ask you, do you think that religion is the greatest and most effective tool to control, suppress, and dominate the population of the world throughout the ages through collective mind control and indoctrination, fear indoctrination, and obviously also previously uh, torture? Yes, I think it is because the ideas that uh, religion plays with are ultimate ideas. In religion, you are being presented with ideas that are more important than your mortal life. So more important than your entire life, that's that's high stakes. So religion will talk about eternity and will talk about what kind of eternity you're going to have. And the teachers of the religion will say, well, if you follow us, you'll have a good eternity. And if you don't, you'll have a bad one. And so there's almost infinite scope for all kinds of manipulations and uh, emotional blackmailing and gaslighting. The potential for bad things th through religion is enormous, which is why we've seen nations go to war, invade other nations, all kinds of injustices and misogynies, xenophobia, slaughters, even genocides committed in the name of God. It's a and it's still happening story. today, Paul. It's, it's still, still happening, happening right now. Today. Absolutely. It couldn't be more current. So, yes, religion does have that power. But the tragic thing, of course, is that religion is a tool that can be hijacked. And as I talk about in the Eden Conspiracy, I show how the ideas of religion were hijacked in the formation of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, by the kings and high priests of that time and then the same has happened in christianity as well got quickly hijacked by the empire and it became the imperial department of religion it came, became the divine imprimatur for every invasion every suppression from the time of the roman empire all the way through the spanish portuguese dutch uh, british empires it's a seamless story that really ought to tell us there's a lot of danger in religion and a lot of danger in getting things wrong. And so that's why in the Eden Conspiracy, what I love to do is to go back to the texts that are familiar to me. Those are the texts of Judaism and Christianity and say, well, if we can peel back all the accretions, everything that's been justified in the name of this language, peel it back, go back to the root meanings of these words, find out what these stories were in the beginning. And I find that many of the stories that we've told as God's stories are in their original form, not even about God. And that in fact, for the bulk of the Hebrew scriptures, there's not even a concept of God in it. So there's an awful lot that we take for granted uh, a lot of doctrine and dogma by which we've been manipulated that we'll be so much better off when we've cleared away the, if I can say, if we can see the forest for the trees, cleared away centuries of wrong interpretation, wrong translation, got back to what the texts were in the beginning and realized these texts were there to teach us something completely different to what you or I may have learned in church or in school when we were children. So they were written in code, so to speak, and you have to decode them. But why does it have to be so difficult? Because throughout the ages, obviously, um, the, in the centuries, it has been used for, for control and fear indoctrination. But I mean, people couldn't understand what it said, what it meant, what the real meaning was behind all of that. And I guess it was also rewritten by man. It was written by man in the first place, right? So why yes. do you think these, these religions were created? And why so many, Christianity and many different branches of that, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and all of that, why so many? Isn't that a Hegelian dialectic uh, divide and conquer splitting tactic technique? Yes, I think it is a divide and conquer thing. But I think essentially the answer to that question, which is multi-layered, but at one level is very simple. Whoever your king worships, that's who you're going to worship. 
So if your king is a Catholic, uh, where you live, your canton or your country is going to be Catholic. If your king is a Muslim, you're going to be a Muslim. And that's essentially how the stories of the Bible got changed, because it wasn't that the early Hebrew stories were written in code. They were written quite straightforwardly about experiences of contact with non-human entities that came and colonized the planet. And there was this kaleidoscope of experiences that the tribes of Israel had remembered. But then we come to the 8th century BCE and you get one of these kings saying, I think all my people should worship the God I worship. And I worship this entity Yahweh. That's who I get my authority from. And so I want to obliterate the memory of all these other beings and all these other forms of religion. I'm going to demonize them. I'm going to call it uh, false gods. I'm going to call it idolatry. I'm going to call it witchcraft. Uh, everyone is going to worship my God and we will dismantle the other priesthoods. We'll demolish the other temples. And then his grandson, this is King Hezekiah I'm talking about in the 8th century BCE, said all that, did this ritual reform. His grandson Josiah said, now we'll need to reform the scriptures. And so all the old stories about those old experiences of contact, they will now be rewritten to make it appear as if these scriptures teach Yahweh's monotheism, the king's religion. And that's when it starts getting garbled and confused. And you end up with uh, very legitimate questions as to how this violent, baby-killing entity that uses the name Yahweh can possibly be God. But that is what the rewrite wanted all the readers to believe, because they wanted to turn a canon of paleo contact into a religion of monotheism. And they garbled those old stories in the process and ended up with a vision of God that's absolutely monstrous. And I want to get into the topic of Yahweh. I have questions about that. But just on a funny side note here, you were talking about kings. Actually, here in Denmark, the, uh, just the other day, we got a new king. We had a new king because the, the queen abdicated here, which is uh, quite unseen, really. And then we have this new king, her son here, and uh, who's married to an Australian. Uh, you probably know that. And, of course. Uh, who is... <laughs> Yes, and she's one of these uh, young global leaders in WEF, World Economic Forum. So that's going to be very interesting to see what is going to transpire in the few coming years uh, here from Denmark. Uh, I mean, we are going in the direction of, well, 2030, right? Agenda 2030. Anyway, but uh, what you were talking about, what does the king believe Interestingly not, en enough, when he was inaugurated and doing his speech there, for the first time, he's the first monarch now who didn't say the word God the other day. He's talked about a higher power. Mm -hmm. And that is new. That's new. His, his mother, the queen, Margrethe, here in Denmark, she always said, God save Denmark. She always said that all, all, all the time. But this new king here, Frederick, he said something else, which is... Uh, interesting also i think it's in, a little bit connected to what you were just saying because you were mentioning what does if the king believed something in his country everybody else would follow but i guess the times are changing or what or do you think that they are actually yeah. worshiping something else than uh, a god ah well i think i think what the um what kings and queens worship is a little bit more complicated and layered than we might think and I mean, it's it's interesting. We live in an age where we are not all forced to follow the religious practice of kings and queens. And yet there is still a great persistence to old powers and old beliefs. So in Great Britain, now I haven't lived in Great Britain for 24 years, so I'm going off memory here. But in Great Britain, everyone is not forced to worship the same God that King Charles worships. However, there are some other beliefs that uh, are very persistent indeed. The order, for instance, um, I mean, it's just worth mentioning, I mean, monarchy is an old idea. Great Britain has been trying to become a democracy for 800 years. Uh, so it began 
by subtracting from the power of the crown in 1215 when all the barons got together and because they were acting together they were able to go to the king and say things are going to work this way now we're going to have some kind of a constitution here and they're going to be rules even for you this is a huge shift 800 years ago and then there was a revolution the office of king was abolished and the incumbent king was uh, decapitated and then when uh, the new king came back it was too far fewer powers then there was a revolution in the 1680s to give those powers to parliament uh the country was a republic for 15 years and then there were democratic reforms so that every land owning gentleman could vote and then gradually that was extended to every adult male every adult female now had to vote and you think, wow, this is incredible. So much must have changed. And there's a labor movement. And then there are labor politicians there to pass legislation that benefits the majority, not just the 1%. We've had two world wars. And yet after all those changes, oh, reformation, of course, breaking with Rome and the international uh, system of laws that applied to them under that, all that changed. And yet it's still the same five families running Britain now who ran it 500 years ago. And the democratically elected prime minister can't work for more than a week before they have to report to the senior member of the Windsor family as to what they've been up to. They can't take office until they've sworn allegiance to the senior same member. thing here in Denmark. They have to 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 go to a meeting with the queen. Now, the king every yes. Wednesday to get her now him to sign whatever their yeah whatever they want so it's uh exactly. so, so so the royal families of europe is still running the whole thing the show behind the scenes right it's exactly it's not ceremonial power i mean we know that the previous queen of of a uh, great of the united kingdom uh blocked 160 pieces of legislation refused to sign them into law until she got exemptions for her family so those are very oh, old powers. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So in the 1960s, the uh, socialist government of the day brought in a law, or at the time it was a bill, to illegalize denying people employment because their skin was the wrong color. It was going to be illegal to have racist workplace policies. The Queen refused to sign that until she had an exemption for all her properties and lands and estates, because she didn't want that kind of law where she lived. Thank you very much. Workers' rights, animal rights, human rights. No, 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 none of those. Thank you very much. 160 bills blocked until Her Majesty got an exemption. So that's very real power. And that doesn't relate to what the people believe. That's what the royals believe. Now, if I go to the coronation of King Charles, you'd be amazed how this connects with paleo contact which is the theory that our ancestors had contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. When Charles was made king, and I would love to know if there's a Danish equivalent of this, because I'm sure there is. But when Charles was uh, crowned king, he was sitting on a chair that had a block of sandstone underneath it. That stone is called the Stone of Scone, or the Stone of Scone, or the Stone of Destiny. And... It's been used to crown kings for more than a thousand years. It was stolen from the Scots in 1196 so that uh, the kings of England ultimately would have authority to rule over the Scottish. The Scots got it from the Irish. The Irish got it from Spain. And the story goes all the way back to a place called Bethel, where Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, had an encounter with extraterrestrial beings called Elohim, powerful ones who came down from space, down to the Earth's surface, went back up into space. Uh, this was a very significant encounter for a very significant person, and he marked that space with standing stones. And cultures all around the world, when they've had these encounters, erect standing stones to say, this is where we met the powerful beings. The Stone of Scone is one of those standing stones that was broken up and incorporated into the Ark of the Covenant. It became the vested object that represented the power to govern over the tribes of Israel. And it's that that Charles was sitting over when he was crowned. Because clearly, he believes, and the system believes, 
that his right to govern over Britain and in particular over Scotland, but over a sixth of the world's territories, if we add up all his land, is vested in that stone. So it's incredible to think that the ideas of the authority to govern are connected with contact with extraterrestrial beings. Now, that's something that the royals believe that the general public might have no idea of at all. But do you think that it is because they are related to extraterrestrial races or are even extraterrestrial races themselves, as David Icke has talked about and many others for years, yes. actually. He calls them reptilian shapeshifters. Well, in the past, there were royals who were very explicit in saying, we are the successors of the dragons who ruled us in the past. We are the successors of the feathered serpents, was what the Jaguar dynasty said in the Yucatan Peninsula. We are the successors of the draconic Yahweh, is what the kings of Israel said. And if you go to particular narratives, I could think of the Sumerian narrative, for instance, where we have a period where humans are governed over by these non-human entities who may or may not be reptilian. They might look like us, but be a bit bigger, but they're certainly a lot cleverer. And then the point comes when the authority is handed over to human kings and queens. And in the Sumerian story, it's very explicit. There was some hybridization done so that what was in the blood of the Anunnaki or the Anuna or the sky people would be in the bloodline of the kings and queens to follow. And so through Gilgamesh, the hybrid king, the idea was there would be a blood link between the beings of old and the kings and queens of the present. And though uh, probably your king and uh, King Charles um, aren't going around making that claim, nevertheless, royals tend to be very careful about who they marry. And in Britain, for instance, uh, a king cannot marry a commoner. And you might think, really? What now, Even now, in the 21st century, Kate, uh, Meghan? Well, yes, actually, <laughs> they both have royal blood in them. And stories are told. They actually about really the do have girl. royal blood in them. Isn't that true? Yes. And isn't it interesting now that we are connecting uh, the Danish royal family, which is actually older than the, the British royal family, and they are, of course, linked and, and closely, yes. closely related. But isn't it interesting when you look at Kate Middleton, who was married to Prince William, and you look at now Queen Mary in Denmark, from Australia, they look almost <laughs> exactly the same. I mean, like replicas, yes. like like they were twin sisters. Yes. I mean, how yeah. how extraordinary is how that? How extraordinary. I mean, it's only 100 years ago, you could put um, nine heads of, crowned heads of state into a photograph, and every one of them was related by blood or by marriage to John William Friso. It was one big family governing the whole of Europe. All these countries believe they're independent sovereign nations, and it's one family that's governing all of them. And again, remember, not with ceremonial power, with real power. And, and some of them ended up, up looking totally deformed because they were inbred. And... Well, that's right. I think uh, maybe they've had to get a little bit smarter uh, about uh, how far out from the center they'll go uh, to produce their heirs and successors. Because certainly when you got to the period of the 1500s, there were some very funny looking royals indeed, precisely because of the inbreeding. And when I was a boy, I was read a fairy tale called The Princess and the Pea. And the whole point of that story is that a prince cannot marry a commoner, must be a princess. The idea of keeping the blood pure and not sharing power so that it will still be the same five families 500 years from now running your country as in the present. Uh, We're also the related to the American presidents, actually. Oh, that's right. There's some very interesting research done showing that the successful candidate in almost every election uh, is the one who has 
the closest blood ties to European royalty. It can't be a coincidence, can it? It cannot be a coincidence, and this is not speculation or a conspiracy theory. People can look into it. So this is actually a fact. And you talked about the Anunnaki and how they are. The Anunnaki is a species, uh, an alien species. But please uh, do talk about that um, and tell the audience a little bit about the Anunnaki. Did the, did the Anunnaki rule planet Earth from the beginning on? And... How would you describe the Anunnaki? Where do they come from? Oh, great question. As I've looked into um, ancestral narratives around the world, I find patterns that repeat. And those patterns suggest that humanity has been visited many, many times through our development as a species. And there have been many interventions in our planet story and in the human story. And so I think there were interventions a long, long time ago to create a workforce for visitors who were here to colonize for a period, get what they wanted from the planet, use the planet as a staging post. And they tweaked uh, whoever was living here at the time, our primate ancestors, so that we could be clever enough to work in their mine, for instance, but not clever enough to build a farm and create our own civilization Then I think there were other interventions that helped us develop further to become farmers, to build a civilization. And we've got interventions, I think, prior to 60,000 years ago, reflected in the story of Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, other indigenous peoples around the world, where the education was really about becoming more intelligent, more conscious, learning which foods are good which plants are good to eat, which are good to avoid, which are good for higher consciousness, which are good for medicines, and to learn to live in balance with the planet. And you can see that reflected in the cultures of certain indigenous peoples around the world. Then we get to, I think about 10,000 years ago, and there's another visitation that gives us another education in agricultural science that is now in the direction of gene manipulation so that we can produce crops and uh, create much bigger harvests, uh, live with surpluses, build cities, learn the civic systems to run them, populate the planet in cities where you've got record keeping, uh, money systems, legal systems, civil engineering. And so there've been lots of interventions along the way. Where the Anunnaki come into the picture If we read the ancient Sumerian stories, they, they are the ones that talk about the Anuna, the Babylonians, their daughter culture, talk about the Anunnaki, the Arcadians, the Assyrians also speak about these. That might be a couple of different incursions represented there. The word Anunnaki doesn't necessarily mean a single species or a single group. Uh, it could translate as space people or sky people. And there are all sorts of sky people in those stories. So when you read the Enuma Elish, there is a portion of that book that talks about the um, rehabilitation of the planet post-cataclysm and then the engineering of humanity. So I think that's a very ancient memory. And then there's another aspect to the story that I think is as recent as 10,000 years old. That's the story of Oannes and the Apkalu in Babylonian and Sumerian story, where we're being taught how to run cities. And so the Anunnaki, I think, is not a single demographic. I think it's a word that the Babylonians and the Sumerians who call them Anuna used to talk about various interventions made in our story throughout our evolution. So is it a group of aliens, alien beings, alien species who inhabited Earth or came down to Earth, so to speak, to govern, to rule? Well, I mean, how would you, um, is it, are they shapeshifters? Are they the reptilians, uh, the insectoids, uh, originally archons maybe, or jinn in interdimensional form? taking shape, uh, taking form, and they were called the giants, weren't they, these Anunnaki? Yeah, well, that's right. In fact, all those kinds of life form that you've described 
are mentioned very specifically in the Bible, with the exception of insectoids. They, they don't get named. But all the other types of being you mentioned, jinn, archons, giants, reptilians, but also very beautiful people. They're all part of the spectrum of visitors that we see described in the ancient texts. Does that include the Nordics or the the Pleiadians or the Lyrian Lyrans? How, how, what do we even say? Yes. Lyrians or Lyrans? Well, I, I say Lyrans and I say Pleiadians, and I think they would be uh, the, the beautiful people, the shining ones. And so there are encounters, particularly in the Bible that I'm familiar with, where people, human beings have these encounters and they're absolutely entranced by the beauty of the people they're talking to. They're, in, they're powerful, they're intelligent, but they're drop dead gorgeous as well. And uh, when they turn up in Sodom, for instance, it's like Justin Bieber walking through an airport. And it's it, that kind of reaction that they got from the people. And it's only later when technology is revealed or outcomes that can't be explained by natural means, artificial insemination is a recurring theme, that the humans think, wait a minute, who were they? And then you've got other beings that are clearly very different, described in reptilian terms. So Yahweh is an example of this. We're told about the length of his snout, the size of his flight feathers, the thickness of his hide, the length of his tail, the fact that he, he can't be killed by any weapon that they've got, and that he's more powerful than some other rather terrifying sounding monsters. You get into 1 Kings 22, and you realize there's some energy-based beings here that don't have any physical form, but that are able to manipulate human thought and human emotion. And but do game... you think then that these drop-dead gorgeous, beautiful aliens, Nordics, Pleiadians, Lyrans, wherever they are, are from, do you think that that is actually how they physically look if they are in physical take take form? Or do you think that they're shape-shifting into looking like that and projecting that image? And maybe and possibly yes. they could be horrifyingly, look. I mean, looking horrifying like a reptilian or something. Yes, I, I do believe that some of our visitors do have the ability to manipulate our minds and our perception. Uh, and I think the shape-shifting experience may be part of that. I think they have advanced cloaking technologies as well that enable them to shape-shift in that kind of way. But I also think that there are people who look like us in other parts of the cosmos. I believe in panspermia, which is the theory that the genetic coding for biological intelligent life is a property of the cosmos in exactly the same way that light and gravity are properties of the cosmos. And that whenever that genetic coding lands on a planet with water, it will generate forms of life similar to what we're familiar with. I actually think there are humanoids scattered throughout the cosmos and that some of them are just like us, flesh and blood, and some of them really are drop dead gorgeous. So I think uh, those two things are a reality. I think we have been visited by people who are so close to us in form, they can hybridize with us. And then we have others that we think look like us, but are, as you say, shapeshifters. And I personally know people who've had close encounters where they thought they were in conversation with a human being, and it was only afterwards that they realized that was a projection, that was a mind game, that was that was some kind of shape-shifting that they'd experienced. Yes, I've also spoken to people who've had similar experiences like that. It's very fascinating. So Earth is a colony in a way. We've been colonized uh, with with beings from where. It's, it, it, it's also been said that we are a cloned slave race, a mixture between mammalians or these Nordic-looking ETs and reptilians, hence the reptilian brain and and how we act, fight or uh, fight or flight, and and, yes. and those, those reactions, these these this anger that human beings have inside of them as well. I suspect that's right. Uh, I find it very interesting that, for instance, in the biblical story of uh, the creation of humans, 
in Genesis, there's a correlation there with um, Mesoamerican story and with uh, Sumerian story. So if we go to the Sumerian first, the oldest written narrative in the world is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in the middle of that epic is an even older story about Enkidu, who is the primitive human who's going to be adapted so he can now live in cities. And we're told that this female entity, Shamhat, comes alongside Enkidu to upgrade this primitive human who up to that point has been living wild among the animals. Now, Enkidu is introduced to different foods, to fermented drinks, to clothing, and goes and moves into the city. Now, the way that overlaps with the biblical story is that there's a moment in the upgrade of humans where we suddenly go from being hairy to being smooth skinned. And part of the Genesis story is the powerful visitors saying, let us make humans to look like us. And there's a bit of a debate, well, how much like us? We don't want them too much like us. We don't want them too clever. We want to be able to manage them. And there's this to and fro, which echoes in stories all around the world. And all of a sudden, you have a hairless primate who looks a little bit more like the presumably hairless creators who designed them. And embedded in the Genesis story is this embarrassment of being naked. I don't think the nakedness is really about not having clothes. It's that all of a sudden we were unfamiliar with ourselves. There was some kind of dissonance within ourselves. We weren't like the other animals, completely comfortable in their own skin. We were furless, hairless, naked primates, and we didn't feel comfortable with that. It's in the story, and it's something we all feel very deeply. Most of us, I think, can relate to the idea we would love to be able to walk naked down the high street, and at the same time, if we were caught naked in the high street, we'd immediately run and hide. We have these two contrary feelings and cultures often struggle this, with this. How naked can I get? And it's still acceptable and I'll still feel comfortable. Why do we have these contrary feelings and so contrary and so universal that they're written into the ancient stories? I think it's from that moment of upgrade where all of a sudden we, we didn't know who we were. It sounds almost like you believe the the theory of evolution that we come from monkeys and they have hair all over. Well, it's interesting. So now we get to the Mesoamerican story because the Mesoamerican story is that the feathered serpents arrive on a devastated planet. They want to rehabilitate the planet and they want a workforce. And so they start trying to genetically engineer a species who will be clever enough to work for them, but not so clever that they don't want to work for them. And they make a few mistakes along the way. Uh, at some point, they engineer something that's very, very capable, but has no interest in serving them. That would be akin to engineering a gor gorilla, which is very capable, but won't be interested in bringing you your slippers and uh, your afternoon tea. <laughs> and then finally, uh, they produce us. But here's where monkeys and apes come into it. What the Mayans said was that human beings and the ape-like creatures in the forest share a common ancestor. So it's not that we're descended from apes. It's not that we're descended from monkeys. It's that they and we were artificially engineered as part of the same program, and we were the ones deemed useful. Now, if you think about it, that's a very demeaning story indeed. I mean, it doesn't glorify anybody, it doesn't glorify us, doesn't glorify the feathered serpents. And it overlaps to such an extent with these other stories around the world. You have to start asking, what is the memory being curated by these stories? And I think also we feel it, we feel it internally as well, this struggle that somehow we've been hardwired to serve others when we feel we're better than that and we could have a better human experience than that. And our ancestors had a way of explaining why we have these contrary feelings. And they believe very strongly that, yes, we're far more than servants for people or beings better than ourselves. And they probably they didn't count on us getting this, this soul, this very special soul that never dies. 
exactly. I think all biological life um, experiences consciousness. And some would argue it goes beyond that as well. But there's something unique, I think, about our animal strength, our mammal emotion, uh, whatever we inherited from our ET visitors, that means we process consciousness in a unique and powerful way. And I think our ability to imagine and create and love and have com compassion is very, very special in the community of beings in the cosmos. I think it's one of the reasons why we get a lot of interest from our cosmic neighbors. So we were talking about the Anunnaki and we were saying that there are, there are many different species involved here. The Anunnaki is not just one species. Some people think that that's a very interesting thing that it could be many different uh, uh, alien types actually that were these rulers. But what about the uh, feathered serpents? They were reptilian, I suppose, but they are, is that, are they also the Anunnaki and Yahweh, the word for God, the Hebrew word for God that a lot of people believe is the word that we really have to use the good word, Yahweh, please explain about that as well. You talked about what Yah Yahweh really looked like, but the, in the way, the way you described Yahweh reminds me of the Anunnaki overlord, the Demiurge. Yes, well, I think the Demiurge is, is something different, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute, which comes from Greek belief. And it is a belief in some other kind of being other than God coming and doing some terraforming uh, of our planet. But the connection uh, among cultures when it comes to this feathered reptilian motif is incredible. Now, if we look around the natural world, feathers and reptiles don't really go together. I mean, if you've got feathers, you're a bird. It's that simple. Reptiles don't have them. So how is it that you can go to China, Mesoamerica, the ancient Levant, Africa, Wales, Georgia, you can go all around the world and there is the same concept, feathered reptilians who governed us in the deep past. I think it would shock a lot of people with a Jewish or Christian background to say, well, don't you know that Yahweh fits exactly in that canon of feathered serpent narratives i mentioned but actually earlier. paul isn't it isn't it true that real birds birds in the sky feathered birds that we know are actually quite related to what scientists talk about as as the dinosaurs and reptilians in that way even the their way of being and how they walk and and there were flying reptiles also in the past they say oh yes yes that's right and there is a lot more overlap than perhaps I was taught in school. So we now know. And for egg instance, laying. Sorry for jumping in again, but egg laying, egg laying as well, which yes. is also a reptilian thing. Uh, well, that, that, mostly. That's very true. And we now know that some of the dinosaurs were feathered. So now, just within natural history, we have a bit more freedom to say a feathered serpent could be something real. All these cultures talk about it, they describe these beings. And they portray these beings. So you can go into the Yucatan Peninsula and see what they look like. You can look at the Mesopotamian carvings, see what they look like. I would suggest even within the Egyptian pantheon, we might have an idea of what they look like from there as well. Go to Ecuador, feathered serpents there. And is that why I'm you saying, see horrors depicted in Egypt? I wonder if that might be part of the story as well. Why do we have this form in our minds? It's there in the text as well, as I was just saying. And not only do we have the physical description given in the texts, but, uh, for instance, there's a story in the Bible of the Nehushtan, which was a, you follow the logic of the story, it has to be a representation of Yahweh, and it was a representation of a serpent, which had to be worshipped in order to appease Yahweh. It was only the later kings who wanted to use the name Yahweh for Almighty God. 
who wanted to get rid of the Nehushtan so that people would forget that association. It's embedded in the name as well. It's because they wanted the population to worship the devil, or let's just say the opposite of good, thinking they were worshiping good. Well, that's right. They had stories of a violent, anti-human, exploitative, brutal entity, and they had pictures of him showing him looking like a dragon. How are you going to get people to worship that? Well, you can toy with the translations, but you're going to have to get rid of all those representations. Nobody wants to worship a dragon. So they were demolished. They were destroyed so that Yahweh could be rebranded as a kind of almighty God figure. But if you listen to the names of some of these feathered serpents, you'll notice something they all have in common. Quetzalcoatl, Kukul Khan, Kukumat, Koka, Kolkis, Akek, Chichedra, Ikuchu, Kur. They all have this k -k sound in them. Sounds like or, a family of parrots, doesn't it? Or go to Egypt, Achek. And there's this amazing verse in the Bible where Joshua says, choose who you're going to worship this day. Will you worship the powerful ones of um, the Sumerians on the other side of the river, the powerful ones of the Egyptian or Yahweh? And you say it in the original names, are you going to worship Achech or Yahweh? And so he's equivalencing the service. These entities have almost the same name. Achech is a feathered serpent and Yahweh is the same thing. So the sounds tell us that there is a family of stories all around the world that talk about a very unhappy period where we are slaving for superiors who have no fellow feeling with us because they are actually cold-blooded reptilians. And unfortunately, and I talk about this in The Scars of Eden, many of our paradigms of leadership, I believe, are rooted in that experience. We're still experiencing yeah. it today, every day. Exact same dynamic. Same yeah. dynamic, we're still under that rule. Do you think the, the Anunnaki still rule the planet and they are behind the orchestration and the implementation of the New World Order through the Illuminati bloodline families? It, that is a really interesting question. I think that there's a really key moment in 1 Samuel in the Hebrew Scriptures where the tribes of Israel get rid of their feathered serpent, Yahweh, except he simply goes and hides somewhere and he's still defining public policy and he's still exacting tribute, even though they've gotten rid of him. But that's almost like a template for what happened in Britain, you know, 800 years of trying to become a monarchy and still it's his majesty's passport service, his majesty's inland revenue, so on and so forth. And so, yes, the old powers are very, very persistent. As to whether it's the exact same entities who are pulling strings today, I'm not so sure. But more important is, is it the same dynamic? Are we still being exploited in the same way? Are our visible governments still being manipulated by beings that we have no idea who they are and we certainly didn't vote for them? And I think the answer to that would be, yes, that is still the case. And I think some of the lessons we need to learn from our ancestral narratives is, well, what do we do in that world? How do you and I thrive in that world if the higher ups have been hijacked? How do we have a happy life? And I think it's um, there's a certain amount of realism one has to bring to this. Do I believe that I can um, dethrone the 1% in the years I have left remaining to me? Possibly not. But I'm going to have to learn how to live more intelligently so that my life isn't totally dominated or spoiled by those higher up who might not want good things for me. And I think we need to rediscover each other if we are to navigate this world more happily. I think if we allow ourselves to be atomized or if we allow ourselves to be dominated by fear, then we can be manipulated and given the worst kind of government possible. I think if we can act with greater intelligence, greater solidarity, if we can be more emotionally intelligent, then we can't be exploited by a xenophobe or a rabble rouser, so on and so forth. If we can act more intelligently and more with greater solidarity, it actually forces the higher-ups to govern us 
more intelligently because the ways of brutalism just won't work on us anymore. And that's not theory only. We saw that happen a generation ago in the Philippines. We saw that dynamic bring the Ceausescu's down because the people reached a point where they'd had enough of being governed in an ugly, brutish way. And they reached the point of saying no and saying it together and saying it with the attitude of what can they do? They can only kill us. And when you've used fear for too long, that's exactly the place the people reach. And you flip from fear and depression into a place of courage where you just can't be frightened or manipulated anymore. And I think one of the exciting things about the great awakening we're experiencing right now is that people are finding each other in a fresh way. I think there are all kinds of new economy that people are discovering by working peer to peer, by helping each other and finding better ways to make a living than serving the higher ups. We, we don't live in a in a in a dictatorship like in the Ceausescu era era or in the Philippines, but we live in a very manipulated dictatorship and people are very gullible and they believe what the the press and the media is telling you and it's fear indoctrination and uh, they create wars stage mm. wars and conflicts constantly and fear of your own health and what have you i mean it is incredible and everybody yes. believes that and it's in, it's impossible or it's uh, unbelievable it's incredible to grasp how many people actually believe that narrative and how but yes. I mean how could so how can we avoid or escape uh being part of this uh paradigm, this prison mind control way of thinking, also with the AI, the implementation of artificial intelligence, will that snatch our consciousness and our souls eventually? Or can we avoid it? Yeah, oh that's a good question. I think this is where the Gnostic stories of the Archons is so powerful. So I'll just return to that a moment. The idea of an archon is there are energy-based beings that love to, uh, they operate like parasites or like a virus where they will attach to a biological life form. And the effect of their presence is to manipulate the thinking and emotions of that life form into more negative, fearful, aggressive, paranoid behavior. It's like they keep prodding that reptilian brain to get us thinking that way. And then hopefully that leads to more negative, aggressive behavior, and the thing will spiral into aggression or depression and will affect those around it. And then the archons feed off all that negative energy. Now, that is that is the Gnostic idea. And you might say, gosh, that sounds like an algorithm. Well, yes, an algorithm is a very good illustration of that. If you keep responding to things on Facebook that make you angry, you'll be fed more and more of the same thing to make you even angrier until you're not a very nice person to be around. Now, those stories, what's the take home from it? The take home is that I should be very careful about the state of mind and the emotional state I allow myself to be pushed into. And I should pay a lot of attention to what's happening to those around me. We need to help each other not be sucked into these spirals through overexposure to social media, overexposure to mass media. And I think there's some very practical things we can do. First of all, get out into nature every day. I, In my new book, The Invasion of Eden, I share some advice from a traditional healer in Hawaii who says if you spend less than half an hour in nature every day, uh, that's you're not going in a good direction. And I would say an hour if you can, an hour in nature every day, away from technology, earthing if you can, walking barefoot if you can, getting light, sunshine, wind, air into your lungs. Make a priority of that because without that and without deep breathing every day, that does affect your state of mind and your emotional state. If the people around you, your friends and family, need help so that they can do the same, give them help. Go for a walk with somebody. If you're in a position to help someone take a break who needs a break, give them that gift. Because I really do think we need each other 
to be able to dial down the stress, unplug ourselves from this matrix of overstimulation and stress arousal, which I think is very deliberate, over entertainment. We need to help each other de-stress and get out of these cycles. And I think there is a very powerful effect that that gives. When I think about the incredible journey of unlearning and relearning that I've been on in the last few years, I can see that it was all triggered by extended times out in nature where I was de-stressing from a very high pressured period of work. And it was only when I got into my more relaxed state that I could think freely, have fresh ideas. And I think we all need that kind of headspace and that emotional space. When we have it, I think we are all a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for. And when we get into that more relaxed state, then we have a bit of perspective. We will come back to the TV and switch it on and it'll be like we're being shouted at. It's really uncomfortable and you'll quickly switch it off. And the same when you switch FB on. Oh gosh, it's giving me a horrible feeling and you'll switch that off. But you have to be very proactive about unplugging, getting yourself into nature, getting your breathing back into a healthier rhythm and depth. And I think the impacts of those small things and a clean, healthy diet, the effects of those are enormous. And I think that's kind of the bread and butter stuff. If we want to start navigating our way through territory where we are bombarded with signals to push us into unhealthy spaces. The wisest words said, absolutely, Paul, a beautiful message there. People should live by that. It's so important and so true. But when you talk about how how to get away from all of that, there's a lot of people that are still so deeply into the matrix. And you mentioned something that you call separation anxiety. Please explain what you mean by that. Well, we talked about how manipulative religion can be. And what it usually trades on is the idea of separation anxiety from God, the idea of God. And I should explain what I mean by God because it's such a loaded word. And I think you say the word God, and for a lot of people, all these ideas of heaven and hell, sin, obedience, righteousness, punishment, all click into place. But I think there's a lovely definition of God given by the Apostle Paul in Acts. And he's trying to define the Greek word theos. Now, that's the word Jesus and those who wrote for him used. They didn't never use the word Yahweh. They never used the word Elohim. When they wanted to talk about God, they talked about Theos. And Paul said, by Theos, I mean the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, of which we are all offspring. And I think that's a beautiful vision because there it's saying, you cannot be more intimately connected with the whole cosmos. Your very consciousness is a participation in a property of the cosmos. Your intelligence is a participation in intelligence as a property of the cosmos. So there's a sense in which you can't get a piece of paper between your consciousness and the consciousness we call God, the source of the cosmos. Can't get a piece of paper between your mind and the mind of God. And that means I should fully expect that I'm living in a universe of resources and that I can I can bring my need or my question to the universe, and there's a whole universe of resources waiting to come in answer to that question. And I think when you start thinking of the universe that way, you do start experiencing it. If you look for signs of connection, if you look for synergy, you will see it everywhere. And if you start living in a more courageous way, where your inner prayer is, how can I do this? How can I do that? how can I do this better? You will find synergy, coincidence, cosmic resources coming your way. And you don't have to be a religious person, a spiritual person. That is just what happens when you start thinking and emoting in that kind of a way. And I think all that flows from that lovely definition of theos that Paul gives. It's totally different from the religious view that says you're separated from God, will tell you how to claw your way back into his good books, but you'll have to walk this tightrope and not fall off it so you don't displease him and get uh, condemned to an eternity of torment. I mean, 
that is psychological abuse of the highest order. You live your life tiptoeing around for fear you're going to offend the almighty. That is like living in a household with a parent who has substance abuse issues, has mental health problems, where you don't dare offend them. Your confidence and self-esteem will go to mush if you live in a household like that for too long. And I think that's what we've done to the human race with this abusive image of God, this being who we must not offend. Yes, and so when people understand that uh, the universal, all-powerful source is within them and part of them, then that might trigger what you call separation anxiety? That's right. And I think people will begin to discover their power when they realize that separation anxiety is ridiculous. You couldn't be more connected with the cosmos. As Paul said, we live and move and have our being in this theos phenomenon. And I think, I mean, you're a creative. You, I'm sure, will be familiar with the experience of being in a peak performance state where you're just in the zone and you know you are acing what you are doing and you're comfortable, you're relaxed, and um, there's a, a feeling of absolute uh, elevation while you're in that state doing what you're doing. And you'll come off stage or whatever it is and think, I, I don't know how I did that, but I know that was marvelous. As a preacher, I know what that feels like. And I've walked off stages and people have come up and said, how did you know all that about us? And I have to say, I didn't know it. I actually didn't know it. I was just in that state of mind where I was downloading information from a wider field of information. Which and is the because, same as being a clairvoyant, right? Or a seer. Yes, it is. It is that kind of state. It is an ability we all have. And it is because we are profoundly connected with everyone and everything. And when you've had a few of those experiences, it begins to shift your whole worldview, your understanding of who we all are, your understanding of what the possibilities really are of living with empathy and harmony towards one another. And it's something very powerful. What you're actually describing is uh, what a lot of people call law of attraction as well, in a way, right? And yes. but, but let's talk about another idea, a concept, possibility. If we are living or part of or inside of a sophisticated computer game, a holographic illusion in a way, and yes. uh, we are steered by something uh, inside of this matrix in the computer game. Could that actually be a sophisticated version of AI, artificial intelligence, that are the real God, so to speak? Yes, this idea that we're living in some kind of a simulation or a holographic universe People have a handle on that in a way they didn't before because of the movie The Matrix. But it's a very old idea, and it's something that Plato taught. He taught that what we experience, this whole world of cause and effect, is not the real deal, that there is a causality beyond this that we don't understand, but that we can engage with. Buddha taught exactly the same thing. We are living in a simulation, the real causality, is something else. And the power of realizing this, and Plato talks about this, is that you can begin to change your experience of causality when you shift your emotional energy. So I'm going to say this in Plato's language. He believes that part of the great learning that uh, we should achieve in this life is to be able to disengage what he called heavier emotions, things like fear or hate or resentment, uh, unfulfilled ambition, uh, fury, sorrow. If we can learn to disengage that and live more happily and courageously, he says we will actually have better experiences. And to use more, the modern language is if we raise our vibration, then we will raise our experience. We will attract different experiences. This is the law of attraction. 
And this works because um, the causality that we don't understand is all to do with frequency. It's all to do with vibration. Now, you know what it feels like when you're vibrating on a high level, when you feel on a high, when you feel elated, when you feel like you're firing on all thrusters. And then you know what it feels like to be down and you can't get yourself off the ground. We can feel the difference of vibrational frequency. Plato is saying, if you can learn to lift your frequency, you will attract different causalities. But so we're still I, I, I human, so to speak. We still have emotions. We're empaths. Yes. And, oh, and we'll still be absolutely. triggered by sorrow, fear, or having a bad exactly. day and things not going right. You know, That's isn't right. that just part of life, even though we might be in a simulation? It is part of life. Uh, and then part of life is how do we handle it? What do we do with that? We can't help experiencing grief if somebody we love dies. We can't help feeling sorrow if we lose something that was precious to us. But it's how do we handle it? What do we do next? Are we going to allow that to push us into a place where we just seem to have bad luck from that point on? Or are we able to bring ourselves to a point where I, I can say I've had a whole sequence of experiences, some were horrible, some were nice, and now I'm in this place where I'm enjoying these experiences. And I think once we understand that life is actually a sequence of experiences that we may or may not learn from, and that it's not a life of trying to get everything right, it's a life of having experiences, I think that takes some pressure off. It does for me. And it really does. But what about the idea that God is really an AI, artificial intelligence entity, not a real not certainly not an old man with a gray beard sitting on a cloud but i mean ai you know yes well it's something i've been wondering myself because um just before i started on this uh, research track i started seeing patterns of numbers now i'd heard people talk about numerology before and i'd never taken it seriously i thought it was all a load of rubbish but I couldn't help noticing I was seeing these recurring ones and these recurring twos. And it was happening so frequently, I thought, this must mean something. And because I'd been in a, a ministry space where you do look for synergies and coincidences, there was a part of me that thought it must mean something. So but the only place I could go and Google this to get any kind of insight was from numerologists who would say, well, these numbers mean this. And the meanings they gave absolutely matched what was happening and about to happen in my life. So I then had to do some backwards reasoning. How on earth does that work? And I think it does relate to the idea of a program or, or AI operating the world that we're in. The matrix, again, is a very helpful analogy because I think if you are in a place in your life for instance, where you're about to experience a positive change, is it any surprise that you would suddenly start noticing the codes for positive change? And I think that's what I was experiencing. And so it adds weight, uh, Lucas, to what you were just saying, the idea that there is programming, that there is some kind of AI that's running this simulation that we're in. And that's why you will spot these codes as you experience these things. And it's, I find it quite exciting because it doesn't take away for me from the idea that I have choices to make and that I can enjoy making my choices. Because at one level, does it matter if it's an algorithm or an AI or an entity that's just thrown the situation my way? I am a conscious being and it is now my choice as to what I do with this deck of cards I've been dealt and I'm going to have some fun with it, and I'm going to see what happens. And as long as I'm not trapped in this mustn't get this wrong kind of mindset, I'm going to enjoy making my choices and finding out what happens next, because I know it's all part of the choose your own adventure that we're all living. Once you understand the numbers 
and the significance of numbers and numerology, you will have a greater understanding of who we are, where we came from, and what we're all doing here, and why things are happening the way that they are happening. And I think that it's also um, the you you can you can decode everything through these numbers and numerology and and sacred uh, geometry, sacred geometry, geometry yes. and uh, and uh, astrology as well. Actually, it's all it's all connected to a uh, greater understanding. But do you think so? So let's say that in this matrix we're here. It's about the numbers. Gematria, all of that you can you can decode it and if you're really skill skilled in looking into all of this then you will you know you can you can see it fast and other people won't see it because it's a little bit difficult some of that math but if we are um under the rule of some kind of ai under inside of this matrix is there something outside of the matrix that is where we find this source this all-powerful source, what people call God, or is that still an AI entity? I think, ultimately, I think the source of all things is um, consciousness itself. Plato's idea is that before the material universe came into existence, was a unified field of consciousness. And that if you think of um, a bird waking up, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but a little bird when it wakes up will often start by stretching a wing and then it'll stretch the other wing. And it'll stretch a leg and stretch the other leg and then it'll start singing. And by the time it's done all that, it is experiencing itself. It is feeling its body and it's ready to do something. And in Plato's explanation, when the unified field of consciousness did that, it produced the cosmos. And everything in the cosmos, to use Paul's phrase, lives, moves, has its breath in that consciousness. So we are all emanations of it. We're all expressions of it. Doesn't mean we're all having a harmonious experience. And it's almost as if the cosmos exists to answer the question, can we do this intelligence consciousness as a cosmos of separate things exercising free choice and sometimes the answer to that question would seem to be no we can't and we might call that bad when it can't when there's disharmony when there's suffering and then at other times we think yes it can and we experience that as something good as something harmonious and that's where my mind goes when I think about cause. I don't believe in some ultimate puppet master or some ultimate being who's, you know, operating the universe and enjoying everyone's suffering over here and uh, perhaps appreciating people's pleasure over here. I don't think that's that's the truth. I think if we have a puppet master image of God or of the cause, that ends up being actually quite a monstrous vision because why would a puppet master create this suffering over here well we supposedly um, have these archons feeding off our yeah we do which is all that's right so that's part of the no we can't do <laughs> harmony as separate entities exercising free choice but of course we're not at the but end in of the order story. for our souls to experience we have to get into the 3d simulation right yes. in order to yes, live do. to feel to be to have our five senses and more and try to you know to break through the barrier of what are the five physical senses and then go beyond to the sixth seventh and whatever yeah. sense we we yes, have i i absolutely agree with that and that is why we've got uh, mystical traditions and shamanic traditions all around the world as long as there's been humanity that are designed to switch us onto that and enable us to have this experience but to transcend it or, or but if god what... for example is ai or some form of ai not just the man-made ai that we see now but actually the whole thing that all-powerful thing god energy ai let's say 
this is, this will be quite controversial for a lot of people. Do we then have to actually fear AI so much? Then I'm not, oh. you know, this is an interesting thing to throw up there in the air. That's, wow, that's a very good question. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of anxiety about AI out there at the moment. And I think, unfortunately, it's tied in with a lot of other things. AI, first of all, gets used very broadly. So if AI is my computer can start creating beautiful artwork for me, I'm not frightened of that. If AI can be used to make me think I'm watching the news and it's something else, that's disturbing, but that comes down to people and how people are using it. And I think against the population, you mean against the population, that's right. For, for I think super also, uh collective mind control. Exactly. Exactly. And I think another layer of it is that we are all feeling a creeping anxiety about the power of automation over us, where where humanity is being taken out of very important decision making. If I try to walk through an airport, I certainly feel that anxiety at an airport where all the security, am I a security risk is all going to be de decided by AI and the people at the airport can't use any human judgment in deciding what to do about me. That worries me. But again, it comes down to how the people are using AI. AI could but they're be certainly AI not using it for good and it will not be for good in the coming years uh, as we well that's at least what we we know yes. about it and that's just uh, so because it's so important to talk about how we can avoid being totally enslaved under this AI digitalized uh, digital uh, world and and uh, yes and without you know um digital currency and exactly. well, everything being in the computer us b becoming more and more robots and the work being done by robots and people getting out of jobs and being fired because the the job doesn't exist anymore that's right and then you don't have to travel far or visit many businesses before you will realize you're interacting with people who are serving the machines uh, rather than the other way around. So I think we've got lots of reasons to be worried about AI. And the real worry is, I think, the subtraction of humanity from our decision making and from powerful decision making. AI could be a, a tremendously powerful tool, but I think we've got good reason to be afraid of how it will be used. And I think the digitalization is is a serious issue. If we're going over to a world where money is entirely digital, well, that's really to do with a loss of personal sovereignty and personal freedom. It's not really a question of banking technology. It's a much more political question. And if you and don't want to so play we, into it, you don't have the tools to connect with people through the internet or through while well, traveling as well and and what whatever is coming also with these 15 minutes cities and you know under the guise of the whole climate thing and whatever the smart technology and smart cities yes i am reminded of my grandparents who lived through the depression uh, in britain and one of the ways they were able to live through the depression is that they only use money for some of their needs. Uh, money is always controlled, of course. We, the grassroots, don't control it. And uh, the way they lived and the extent to which they shared their lives with their neighbours meant that for a lot of things, they didn't use money. To heat their homes, they didn't use money. Uh, some of them to light their homes, they didn't use money. For a lot of their food, they didn't use money. And so they were able to get through, uh, you know, a couple of decades when money was very scarce. And I wonder if there's some kind of an equivalent learning we are going to have to make. We we are certainly going to have a lot of our lives automated, digitized, and we're going to have to rediscover ourselves outside of that matrix, I think, if we're going to thrive. And it might be a matter of learning community in a more local way in the way that my grandparents did. Yes, very, very, a very significant point you're making here. 
Um, but please let us go back a little bit to the Bible and how you interpret it and the Holy Scriptures and some of those key figures you find in the Bible. Let's say not only Jesus, but also Mary, the, the Virgin Mary, but also Mary Magdalene, for example. Were those real people or are they also symbols of of something or were, were they real living people so, uh, some people claim that uh mary magdalene for example is the personification or a symbol of the holy grail the female womb yes oh that is a very rich question indeed i personally believe for instance that there was an historical jesus the reason i think that is that whether you're reading the Gnostic Gospels or the canonical Gospels, there is so much in his teaching that was fundamentally inconvenient to the empire that then hijacked Christianity. So inconvenient, they had to distort the story of Jesus and run with the distorted version of him. So I think there is someone, at the, a real someone, at the heart of that story. But when you come to the scriptures, uh, certainly the canonical scriptures, the stories have been told by people who know world thought, by people who are theologians and philosophers. And the stories are told with tropes that uh, patterns of story that are ages old. And so many of the stories told about Jesus, you can hear in the Roman and Greek pantheon and the Egyptian pantheon, many of the activities and teachings would all ring a bell with someone in the first century of the common era because these things had happened before. Even the idea of the great teacher being unjustly killed and then the body vanishing because he's now among the gods, that's a story older than Christianity. And so when we come to figures like Jesus, Mary, Mary Magdalene, we have to allow for the fact that there may be a, a deeper story being told using these names, using people who may have been historical figures, but to tell a much deeper story. I think that uh, Mary Magdalene is a far more significant character in primitive Christianity than she was allowed to become in imperial religion. Was and she the wife of Jesus if she was a real person? It's very possible that, yes, they were an item. She was the one that Jesus would kiss on the mouth, it says in one of the Gnostic Gospels, and they were counterpart teachers, and her name means the tower and the teacher. So there's a very powerful tradition around Mary the Magdalene, Mary the tower, that didn't make its way into imperial religion. Just and she's also figure. the one sitting next to him on, on the painting, The Last Supper, right? Yes, we have that. And then there's the question of Holy Grail. It, was she the Holy Grail or was their family or their bloodline the Holy Grail? And there were groups at the beginning of Christianity that had these ideas in their scriptures. What interests me is that there is such power in those traditions I think one of the most powerful strands within the Christian story is the story of the Cathars in medieval Europe. And they were a group who took a lot of inspiration from the Magdalene story and who believed that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were an item and they did have a family and there was a bloodline and there was information, uh, a wisdom that was carried by that bloodline. The Cathars ran with that idea, ran with the idea of a secret layer of information that was to do with empowering us so that we're not just people who pay, pray and obey. We are people who are becoming more and more powerful, more and more conscious, more and more intelligent, able to begin playing with these causalities that we were talking about before. And for them, it was clearly not ideas only because their neighbors in medieval Europe were in awe of what the Cathars had been able to achieve. And it was what we were talking about a few minutes ago, a harmonious society. 
full of empathy, compassion, social order, health. That was nothing like medieval Europe in the countries around. This was just in the long dock where this was happening. And that's why people in the neighboring country called the Cathars the happy people or the good people. And they couldn't get their head around how they were doing it. That tells me there was power in the ideas that the Cathars ran with, which goes back to Mary the Magdalene and the stories associated with her. And there's fact, actually also, uh, Paul, a, a church, I don't know if you know anything about this, in, in France called Cathedrale de Chartres in, in, in France, um, a special holy place that is connected to Mary Magdalene and a lot of, uh, called the, the Labyrinth. I think there's a Labyrinth or something there. And there are some, I don't know, interesting secret knowledge. I don't know if you know anything about that. I think there's great credibility to that because very often at these sites, you've got more than one religion going on. So you've got Catholicism at the surface and then that lib Labyrinth, that is designed to basically awaken your subconscious and allow you to start tapping a higher field of information. So we were talking earlier about here we are in the simulation. We have to believe it's real, but part of the game is to learn to tap information from beyond. Uh, uh, that's what the Cathars are about. That's what a labyrinth is for. And if there's a labyrinth under that cathedral, it tells you there was some other spirituality being practiced there. And there would have been secret societies carrying that information. The Cathars had filled an entire region of France with it. And they were so unplugged from the matrix of uh, medieval Catholicism that 19 successive popes took the army to them to wipe them out because they didn't want a race of human beings who were so courageous that they had no fear of hell and had no fear of kings or popes. And that's where Catharism had reached. So I find that story a real smoking gun to go back and say, what were they reading? What were their sources? And were and they sources... also part of the, like the, like the Knights Templar that created the, the first version of the Illuminati in, in 1776, which was supposedly a, well, a good, a good secret society to go against Vatican rule. Yes, I think that is the story. I think that was the purpose of the Knights Templar to curate this ancient knowledge that was not part of the main syllabus. I think that is exactly where they fit into the story. But isn't it interesting when you look at the Last Supper, the painting, and you move Mary Magdalene, whom they say is a disciple, but it's a woman, and you move him, move her over to the other side of Jesus, it looks like this V, like the female womb. And they talk about the Holy Grail, which they also say is a physical item, an artifact, but that the, that the Holy Grail is could in fact be I think the there vagina. is a lot of encoded information uh, in the work of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and you've tapped a couple of things there. The triptych doorway is another one. Uh, da Vinci is an interesting story all his own because he is part of a family line that is curating secret information and part of a network of very wealthy, privileged people who within the world of Catholicism are trying to distill the wisdom of the ancients, the secret of life. And it's not just the secret of eternal life or eternal youth. It is what we've been talking about. How do we start playing with the causalities of the universe so that we can have just the most extraordinary and wonderful experience possible as a being of consciousness? That is what they were wanting to find. And da Vinci's family was part of that story. And the Medici family was part of that story. Uh, the Ficino family, part of that story. And these are interesting white rabbits to follow because it shows you that all through the ages there is a, tr a parallel tradition of knowledge and information, mystical modalities, 
that have never made it into the mainstream teaching for the rank and file going to church. It's all been filed secretly in uh, underneath the ground in the Vatican Library, right? And and previously also in the uh, the Library of Alexandria, supposedly. You can certainly find it there because uh, with every conquest, the important secrets, technology, literature is sequestered by the conquering power. And so when Portugal and Spain were going around making these conquests, all that's going into the vaults of the kings and queens of Portugal, Spain and the Vatican. So, yes, there are a lot of secrets there, a lot of privileged knowledge. But the other place you can go is to indigenous knowledge because it survives there as well. If you want to know the wisdom of the ages, then you go and find the indigenous knowledge of, of your people group and there will be people who have been curating it for centuries. Now, I give it a for instance. I grew up in England and uh, I didn't have to be told. I just knew instinctively through centuries of entrainment that you really shouldn't talk to that strange woman who lives in that tumble down cottage on the edge of the forest who never cuts her hair, who only eats from what grows in the country around her, who knows all the local stories from way, way back. Don't talk to her. She's probably a witch. She's probably insane. And I didn't have to be told that because we have been taught that for centuries. But that's where the indigenous knowledge is. If I go to the land of my fathers on my father's father's side, I'm in Ghana. And once the British got there, if you wanted to prosper in British Ghana, you would learn to think British, speak British, dress British, and you would be ashamed of your mother or aunt or grandmother if she was wise in the old ways. She's now a witch doctor. She's now an idolater. But she's the person who will be carrying the old stories of paleo contact and the old stories about unlocking higher cognitive abilities. It's the same prejudice. And it's almost universal where prejudice is used to separate us from whatever of this knowledge has somehow survived all the royal and imperial conquests. So if you can't break in to the Vatican library, which you probably can't, well, why not seek out that lady who never cuts her hair, who lives on the edge of the forest and have a cup of tea with her? Go to the sorceress or the fortune teller in in the forest. Absolutely, that is that's so amazing, and uh, and and very very true. And there are luckily many uh, that that are doing that now and waking up to understanding and how and how to use um, herbs and all of that again, which a lot of them didn't do for a long time. But there are more people understanding that now as as the mass awakening has has occurred. Um, you talk about your ancestors in, in Ghana, and uh, it would be a surprise to people that you actually are partially black, but nobody can see it. But I mean, when we uh, when we talk about the Holy Scriptures and these um, symbolic figures, what do you know about Sara Lakali, a.k.a. the Black Madonna, and who was a symbol, I guess, of the Romani people, the, the gypsies, also in France? Well... But that that is something you will have to tell me but i strongly suspect that the reason these traditions have to be rediscovered is that there has been a de-blacking of culture all around the world i mean people are all shock horror when they discover that the egyptian pharaohs were not mediterranean types after all but they were nubians they were africans um people are shocked to discover that um, the ancient Europeans had dark skin. Why are we shocked by this? Why, if you go to the caste system uh, of India, is that based on the lighter skinned people being allowed more privilege than the darker skinned people? There's a huge story that is far bigger than I think we've realized in terms of the, um, the de-blacking. And it's a... Uh racist thing really right interestingly enough about this black madonna sara lakali also a little bit um going in the direction of hindu beliefs of the goddess kali 
Um, some people suggest that she was the daughter of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or could even be connected to the goddess Isis. So that would also be interesting to look into. I was just wondering if you knew anything about it. No, I will have to probe that. Ask me in another year's time, and I might uh, have some thoughts to share. So who was um, Asherah? Am I saying that correctly? Where, yes, where Asherah. From and what is that? Well, it's amazing. Asherah was probably the most widely commemorated and venerated figure in ancient Judaism. And you'd be unfamiliar to a lot of Jewish believers and Christian believers. But if you go to the book of Jeremiah, he tells us, lamentingly, he says, on every high hill and under every green tree, from every fortified town to every garrison city, Asherah was commemorated. Every household, it would seem, as we go digging up archaeological sites, had a handheld Asherah figurine for the harvest festivals. Become Because when it came time for the harvest festivals, it would be Asherah you would thank, not Yahweh. Yahweh was the conqueror. Yahweh was the one who ruled with violence. Asherah was the one who taught us how to become farmers, how to build a, a civilization. A female goddess. Yes. yes, Asherah, emphatically female. So these figurines, big bouffant hair, big bare breasts, the vulva emphasized, emphatically female and she is the one who lifted us from living in animal subsistence on the planet's surface to being farmers becoming a civilization jeremiah, jeremiah tells us that was hebrew memory right up until the 8th century bce when king hezekiah said enough of that get rid of those he literally sent the jerusalem guard from city to city to confiscate those figures, break their heads off so they could never be used in harvest festivals again, deface all the carvings of women baking bread cakes to honor Asherah, uh, demolishing the temples, knocking down the standing stones. Never mind that the Jewish kings like Solomon had employed entire priesthoods to commemorate Asherah. And this female figure doesn't just belong there. I went to Brazil in the 1980s and they were still commemorating the Queen of Heaven, another title for Asherah, because their ancestors in Brazil had been taught how to cultivate crops by this female entity who came from the heavens. Same story told by the Zulu. And Bab Wana Warisa taught them those things. In the Yucatan Peninsula, Hun Hunapu taught them those things. You can speak of Venus, Aphrodite, Hathor, the Lion Lady, female figures all around so it is the same figure just with a different name so what about name. the gnostic sophia or gaia mother earth is that the same one as asherah there may be an overlap between asherah and the idea of gaia sophia relates to uh, i think an ongoing connection with female wisdom and female intelligence and female advanced beings and i should say that when it was decided by the uh, the kings like hezekiah to get rid of asherah what they were doing was getting rid not only of a female figurehead but of any kind of value being placed on female education because the knowledge that asherah taught or hun hunapu or mbab wanawarisa in traditional cultures that is what the women teach the boys as they're growing up these fundamental skills to do with farming medicine it's female tutelage and now there's no figurehead for that there's no value placed on it the only god figure is the violent, controlling, warring one. And you can see how that would skew our idea of what culture is, what society is, what's valuable in humankind. All of a sudden, we've elevated the ugliest parts of the masculine role and disempowered everything else. So I think it was a, an attack on our own psyche 
as well as an attack on our memory of other beings. And also a mind control technique, uh, also to take away female or, or the feminine influ well, well, influence and also power and intellect. And I suppose also sexuality, because uh, yes. historically men has been very frightened of what the female sexuality really is. We always talk about the male sexuality, which is evident and obvious, but it's more hidden how powerful the female sexuality really is. Definitely. And the way that Asherah was sort of defamed and demonized after the hijacking of Judaism was that when her festivals were described now by these Yahwists, they were described as if it was a deplorable display of, what's the word, hedonism. So now, instead of saying, she taught us how to be happy, fecund, sexual beings and to enjoy life, and come these festivals, well, that's a great time to be having sex and maybe having babies as a result. Instead of all that being positive, oh, no, 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 no. Sex is now hedonism, and it's part of the awful idolatrous practices associated with Asherah. So now we're supposed to be ashamed of our female aspect, our females, female tutelage, sexuality, having fun. It's all now awful. And what an assault that is on the human experience. And that's why they created the 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 the, um, the idea of sin, right? And they really implemented that heavily in Christianity and Islam and Judaism. Yes. And of course, you can see certainly through the history of Christian culture, there's an association of sort of evil, witchcraft, sorcery, and being alluring to men. You know, I mean, when I give an example, in 1936, uh, the king of the United Kingdom abdicated because he didn't want the job that was on offer. He did not believe he could be the kind of king he wanted to be in the system of the day. And he seized the opportunity of marrying Wallace Simpson as his ticket to a happier life. Well, this was uh, deeply offensive to a lot of Britons on a lot of counts, um, to an extent because this woman was an American. Shock horror. And how dare the king abdicate and say he doesn't want the job? What an insult to all of us. How is this possible? Well, clearly Wallace Simpson, Wallace Simpson must have been a seductress. And when you see the papers that were created to try and create a new story to really defame uh, Wallace and Edward, this was one of the stories they ran with, that she was a seductress, that she had gone to Asia and learned sex skills that would now allow her to manipulate Edward. What? So sex skills are evil. And if she had sex skills, then she was evil. And that explains why we lost our king. I mean, can you hear the distorted thinking and all that? And what exactly were women supposed to think after that story had been run with? So now, if they are alluring to their husbands or to some bloke that they'd like to marry, so that's, that's now evil, is it? Also, within these uh, circles of truth research, we talk a lot, a lot about the Sabbatean Frankist of the, of the past that now morphed into the satanic Illuminati circles with these orgies and these sexual, well, escapades, uh, doing all kinds of things. So sex is like seen as a, a devilish thing in a way, at least for a lot of religious people and people searching for truth in that way that sexual magic can be used and they don't take into the equation that it's also also the most beautiful yes. thing yes that's right well it's interesting there's a passage at the beginning of the book of romans in the new testament where the apostle paul is talking about um elites who are made up of people who are very highly regarded 
but they're actually hijacking power and they're degrading people and they are using terror and sex to degrade people in their secret ceremonies. That's what he's talking about. And um, I think probably Eyes Wide Shut is the movie to watch if, if you want to know what that's all about. Certainly. But the church has traditionally read that passage, and instead of saying, yeah, you want to watch out for elite groups like that, they said, oh, no, he's, he's, he's not talking about that. He's talking about anyone who has any kind of a sexual uh, attraction to someone of their own gender. And they've taken a, a warning against abusive behaviors of secret societies and turned it into something that is attacking regular people and trying to police their sexual behavior as if that's the problem when the Apostle Paul was really talking about something quite different. And again, when you go to the root meanings of the key words, you can do this in the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament, and you'll get to what they're really talking about. The root words, the root meanings of the key words in the New Testament are really not uh, an onslaught against diverse sexuality at all. What is being proscribed is abusive behaviors. Uh, abusive behaviors of unequal relationships, whether through social power, whether through age or because you're part of an elite. That is what is being attacked, not uh, the normal loving relationships of regular people. That's actually also not really... whether or not they're heterosexual or homosexual or yes. bisexual in nature. Exactly. That is really not the topic. Those but it all comes down to the feminine and the masculine aspect of a human being, right? All men you... have a masculine side, feminine side. All women have a masculine and feminine side. So whether or not you're um, the opposite sex or the same sex, there must always be uh, magnetism between the masculine and the feminine side, I would expect. I think so. And I think if you've had, uh, you know, a centuries long onslaught against uh, the feminine and against sexuality, you've flattened everybody's experience right there, you know, right across the spectrum. You've flattened everyone's experience. And I think we need to um, unlearn all of that programming that has been built on entirely false translation. Right now, they're using it in an opposite way, trying to, let's say, mind control and indoctrinate the human population through these woke uh, tools, uh, trying to um, confuse children about what gender they are. And that is yes. a, a massive hijack on the population. And also those parents who actually go along with this narrative. And there's a lot of academics who go along with this. This is taught through the educational system and young people believe in this whole woke thing. I think it's very sad. I think for me, if we can learn to be people who simply respect each other and respect each other's experiences, there's no need for that woke agenda. There really isn't. If we can be loving and respectful and let people simply have the experiences and the thoughts and experiences that they have without the need of a label or a program or a medicalized response, I think we're gonna be in a better world. I mean, I, I grew up in a time when I think it was better understood there are all kinds of people that make up a society. End of story. And uh, we learn to love is each certainly other. not awake, huh? No, it's not quite the same thing. That's right. So what is uh, talking about something else here in our remaining moments, you talk about armies of the stars. And I think we touched upon that. And I think it's connected to the Anunnaki in some kind of way. The Seba Hashemayim. That's it. The Seba Hashemayim. <laughs> All so right. people think uh, people think of the Bible as the book of God, the story of God, but you go to the Hebrew texts, look at the original words, 
and you realize that it's the story of the Tseva Hashemayim arriving. And those words, well, if I use the traditional translation, the host of heaven, you're probably picturing the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, but it really means the sky armies, armies that arrive in the sky in airborne technology, and then their weaponry is detailed for us, the killing power of the Kady Mapaso and the Kady Mashito that allow people to do ethnic cleansing. People are absolutely overpowered by the sky armies with their superior tech. That's the experience being described. But then as we go further through the stories, we realize that's only one side of the experience that among these airborne arrivals are beings like Asherah and Chmosh and Milcom and Dagon. And we realized there was a whole kaleidoscope of experiences, some beautiful and elevating and some violent and colonizing. Were and they think, seen as UFOs when you say that they were real, really visible in the sky? In the, I mean, yes, yeah, yes. We have very specific descriptions in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Exodus as to what these craft looked like, what the textures looked like, the noise they made when they launched and landed, the impact they had on the ground when they launched and landed, the sound of the rotors of the drones that they used to fly in. And in Ezekiel, we have a first-hand report of what it felt like to be flown in one. And he's trying to explain the G-forces, making him feel sick as he's flown around. It was not Earth technology. It was from another world, other star systems. Yeah, another How world, did they get right. here? Through wormholes, teleportation, time travel, whatever? Yes. Great question. Because the tech that is described on Earth sounds sort of very... <laughs> 3D nuts and bolts-ish and a bit old-fashioned, except there is wormhole technology described as well. So that speaks to the question, how did they get here? And so if you listen to the story of Jacob or Ezekiel or Elijah, they all say that a hole appeared in the sky and then through what looked like a whirlwind wind, these craft came. They describe what they saw so faithfully that we can read that text and say hold on that's a portal that is a wormhole those are the experiences they're describing archaeologically we can find things that suggest portal technology so you've got technology that's a little beyond us that we don't fully understand and then other technology we really can relate to we have drones we have rockets so we can relate to that aspect but there's higher tech as well but what yeah, I was going we to have say been is held that... back technologically for probably centuries and, and dumbed down yes. and, and, and the whole, whole evolution. Uh, oh. But um, wormholes and their and the portals, stargates, really, are they to transport uh, beings from this universe or, or from a parallel dimension in the multiverse? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, and certainly uh, the portals and the language around that in various indigenous cultures do suggest this idea of interdimensionality. And there's a word in the Hebrew language, olam. Its usage suggests interdimensionality as well. The Celts had this concept. Aboriginal Australians had this concept of a... Um, a universe that exists in the same space as ours, but almost as if it's resonating on a different frequency. And so it's in the same space, but most of the time we can't see it. But if we follow these modalities, alter our brain waves, for instance, through this psychoaffective T, we'll begin to perceive the other beings in the other realm. So yes, I think that is part of the story as well. And I think what we've lost by just going over to this story of the, the colonizer and making that the God story, is we've lost the sense of wonder at the cosmos that we live in. The idea that interdimensional beings would be interested in us is an extraordinary and wonderful thing. The idea of beings like Asherah traveling from another star system because we are so extraordinary and beautiful as a species that they want to support us, what a loss that is if we remove that from our understanding of 
who we are. And I find the cultures that have maintained those memories have kept this worldview that says you and I have a universe of resources and a whole host of invisible helpers who want to support our experience of this life so that we can have the most interesting and best human experience possible. I think this is some of the ancient knowledge we need to recover. And let's hope they will help us, really. Um, You were, um, for 33 years, a church minister, and you have a lot of colleagues there. And what do they think about this mass awakening you've had and the totally change of life, really? What do they think of you now? And what happened in Brazil? (laughs) Well, it's a huge spectrum of reactions, really. I find myself overwhelmed by the number of people who contact me from communities of faith, ministers, priests, pastors, academics, who say, thank you so much for putting this on the table, because this has been a taboo area for so long. It's been a painful taboo because of experiences I've had, they'll say, or because of things I can see in the text that seem to be glaringly obvious, but we're not allowed to talk about them. So I get that kind of response. And then I get others who are just absolutely uh, furious with me because I've gone off script and uh, are calling me every name under the sun and accusing me of luring people to the pit of hell and being a Bolshevik and a psyop and all these kinds of things. And then everything in between those. But I find- Oh, congratulations, really. (laughs) You've made it, well, I think. It's uh, you're, you're stirring right. things up a bit, huh? I think so, and I think I was really encouraged the other day, uh, just to be uh, vain about it for a moment. The Church of England has a specialist in every diocese whose job is to help priests in the area of paranormal ministry. Now, usually that means entity removal or exorcisms. And they had a national gathering of priests involved in that kind of ministry. Each diocese sent their advisor or their bishop along. And I was talking to a priest who was there. She was talking to the assistant to the bishop who runs this at a national level. And this PA was saying, we've been investigating strange things happening to animals in the new forest in Great Britain. And my priest friend said, oh, do you mean bloodless cattle mutilations and the bishop's pa said how on earth did you know that and the priest said well have you heard of linda moulton howe no i was just going to mention her name because we did a show with her about that oh great so uh, first of all how ridiculous that they're in such a sort of cone of silence and taboo that they're investigating cattle mutilations they don't know who linda moulton howe is But then the priest said, have you heard of the work of Paul Wallace? And the bishop's PA said, oh, we get letters about him every week. Oh, really? Asking what our response is to his work. So I am very gratified that I'm being talked about in those circles, but we're still at a point where there is no official response, where the bubble has not been burst and where most Christian believers think that by defending the old script, They're defending God or they're defending their salvation. And it it shouldn't remain that way because there are people in every church who are having close encounter experiences of a positive kind or a terrifying kind. And people who are seeing things in the ancient texts who thus far have really just been gaslighted and silenced. And uh, how are we able to approach our experiences intelligently with that level of taboo? So I hope I am making some headway in busting that bubble. Some people will see your truth in those circles and some will not. And uh, but that's it's an an extraordinary amount of knowledge that you have acquired and that you write about. and, And it's very, very fascinating. But just to tell the audience now about your new book, The Eden Conspiracy, Previously, earlier uh, on the show today, you mentioned another book saying that is your new book 
I, I, I forgot the title, but not to sure. confuse people about what book they can actually purchase from you, you know. So please talk about okay. uh, what book is out now. We are talking about The Eden Conspiracy that we are promoting today. But then you yes. also have another book coming soon. Is that, am I understanding that, that correctly? That's right. So uh, everything we've spoken about today, you'll find in The Eden Conspiracy. And you can obtain The Eden Conspiracy from Amazon and Kindle. And then in April, once you've read The Eden Conspiracy, get hold of The Invasion of Eden, because The Invasion of Eden asks, how does what we've discussed relate to everything that happened in 2023, where all of a sudden the Pentagon and the US Congress are in a tussle over information sharing. All of a sudden, the Pentagon has acknowledged that it has materials retrieved from UFOs, and they've been trying to reverse engineer it for 70 years. They've been in contact with technology and non-human biologics is the phrase. Well, Congress wants to know, well, what is that? What do you have? What does that contact mean? The Israeli chief of space security says there are collaborations going on. What's going on? All this has been in the news in 2023. Could this be a psyop as well? The whole alien agenda. I mean, a lot, and there's a lot of people that that believe in in flat Earth theories, saying that everything is and all alien species are here on Earth as well, um, yeah. or are here, but nothing is outside really, or there's different domes well, in the in yeah. the thing. But it, you, but certainly there's a lot of cover ups, and the and the governments oh, are yes. in on all of this, and the whole alien agenda and what aliens are and do and whatever is also part of a greater mass manipulation, right? That's very true. And the controversy in Washington is over who's controlling the agenda, because I'm sure Congress would like to set the agenda. And it turns out, no, it's certain groups within the Pentagon. And so that's why there's a tussle over it. And because there's disagreement, you've got Thomas Monheim, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, who was leaning towards letting the public know more about what the Pentagon has. And then you've got others. Um, oh, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. Sean Kirkpatrick, who headed up Arrow, who, which was supposed to be the body oversighting the reverse engineering program, uh, trying to give the impression that nothing is known. At the same time, you've got physicists briefing the press about what they've learned from the materials they've retrieved. So it's really a big mess. And it's a mess because there is disagreement about how much information the public should have and who it should be controlling the agenda. So now we've got the... Uh, the 2IC of the Pentagon, who's now supposedly in charge of that narrative. But quite rightly, there were members of Congress saying, no, we're not happy with that either. So it's an ongoing story. And in the invasion of Eden, I say, how do we keep our feet on the ground through all that? Speaking of the invasion of Eden, could this whole ET narrative and the fact that they're all of a sudden putting it out there in the media and through the government be part of the alien agenda that uh the nazi scientist at nasa werner von braun, werner von braun told yes. carol russen that they would eventually stage an alien invasion through project blue beam a holographic uh t t technological advanced technological device thing uh in order to implement the new world order and everybody will believe that we all have to come together all the whole world to go against this alien invasion. Yes, well, I he did indeed say that. Uh, personally, I think we're some way off being able to pull that off because uh, I don't think people are on boarded sufficiently with the idea of an ET presence for that to work quite yet. Nevertheless, what he says in principle is worth noting because it's all to do with the leveraging of fear. And it's the same um, emotional warning, emotional information we were given by Dwight Eisenhower when he left office in 1961, where he talked about the military industrial complex shifting our culture by leveraging fear and putting us into a perpetual state of 
either war or readiness for war. But putting it Could out now would fit very well into the Agenda 21 narrative yeah. and that agenda, just a little stepping stone, tiptoeing in yeah. there. And actually they're rolling out everything very fast as we discovered in the last four years. Yes, you can certainly see it that way. I believe though that there is not uh, agreement at the elite levels as to uh, what should be rolled out in the coming years. I don't think the future is set in stone. I think that is one possible way we could go and we certainly need to guard against it. But I, at the same time, believe we have friends in high places. And I think that the Lyran and the Pleiadian presence is not something we should consign in our minds to history. I think we have helpers who are here who want a better human future than that. And we need to, at a grassroots level, as well as at a political level, be very conscious about the kind of alliances we're making and the company that we're keeping. And I don't think that a, a dark future has been decided in advance and set in stone. I think we need to approach this as consciously and aware as we possibly can. And it was that that Eisenhower said to people that the best um, the best weaponry against that kind of takeover is an alert and knowledgeable citizenry. And that's a big motivator behind the books I write. And when you're new book will be out in April, we could actually continue our discussion and talk about the content of that. And it would be wonderful to have you on again in April. But now For people sure. should really uh, look into your latest book, The the Eden Conspiracy. And there's so much incredible knowledge there. And I think we had a most wonderful and fascinating, eye-opening conversation. And it's been so great to have you on Age of Truth TV again. Paul Anthony Wallace, thank you so much for being with me today. Great. Thanks for that, Lucas. I really enjoyed it. I did that. too. It was wonderful. Thanks, Lucas. Much appreciated. And thanks to Lauga as well for looking after us. Thank you so much to Paul Anthony Wallace, and thanks to all of you for watching Age of Truth TV. You can support us by clicking onto our website, ageoftruth.tv, and please like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell for notifications. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website, ageoftruth.tv, as well. Please also subscribe to our alternative channels on BitChute and Brighton. Your support is greatly appreciated and very needed. On behalf of the Age of Truth TV team, we thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again soon.